directly. So apart from us assessing bodies themselves, we're now at a point where some bodies will come and refer issues to us. We've had issues referred to us on conflict of interest. We've had issues referred to us where, um, th again, there would have been governance issues where members of staff um, or sorry, members of a board would have been paid and that would have been against our code because you shouldn't be on the board if you're being paid and so on. So we've had a various different issues, but uh, what I would say is everybody has positively engaged with us thus far. So we have been able to reach an engagement with them and they follow the steps that we've recommended to them in that time. Um, in terms of Deputy Cowan, you, you brought up the issue with regards to um, the tenant purchase again, and I think I I've hopefully have dealt with that as, as best I can. Um, I think that's most of the issues. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what I what I can add to the question about the adoption of schemes in terms of nursing homes, and I'm hoping uh, Bar Bar Barry may to be able to give you further further information on that. So, uh, thank you, yes. Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in, in relation to Deputy Dowd's uh, comments, I think Miss um, Carroll has looked after most of those. Just in relation to the HFA sources of funding. Uh, there's really there's four. We borrow money from the NTMA, we borrow money from the European Investment Bank, from the Council of Europe Development Bank, and we actually borrow money from local authorities um, because we offer a facility for them uh, to manage their short-term cash flows. So they put uh, surpluses of cash flows that they have just on a short-term basis with us, so we use it as a source of finance. So um, those sources, all of which are government guaranteed, are really what allow us to uh, offer the rates that we do offer, which uh, Senator Keane has identified as being uh, particularly good. The uh, approved housing body rate, which we offer at three and a quarter percent, is significantly below what other lenders in the market would be able to lend, and, and rightly so. Like we're a, we're a semi-state body, we don't have a profit uh, motive in, involved in the thing. We need to just manage our own agency uh, at a break-even basis. Uh, the rates that we offer to local authorities are significantly cheaper because there's less risk associated with lending with to local authorities. Um, so we can actually lend money to local authorities at the moment on, on a quite a low basis, around one and a half, one three quarter percent. Yeah. Can I just come in on that? And it would be in particular in relation to the, sh to the shared ownership and the borrowings there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very briefly, a question that's very important because there's so many stuck at the moment in the shared ownership scheme and yeah, in negative equity, uh, where, where you see the banks, and you are, like, if you like, the bank of the local authority in some instance, uh, where you see the banks writing down or recognising the negative equity and ability to pay and all that. There's no such uh, recognition. And, uh, you know, so maybe is there anything that you, in conjunction with the local authorities and the minister, can do for that group of people? Because it was common, the shared ownership and an awful lot of people are stuck in the middle and there's a clause in there that you can't let out the house you know if you get a job in England you have you know so you, there, there are some measures uh, being developed at the moment between the department and a number of the other stakeholders and things but we've been involved in changing the the way the shared ownership loan is financed they were originally uh, drawn up in the early 80s and they were index link based and those bonds, we paid back the bonds earlier this year. So we're, we're offering uh, the ability to switch the, the shared ownership element of the loan to a variable rate loan which would be at those lower rates to local authorities. We've given people the option. But essentially half of the loan was a shared ownership loan which is essentially renting a house and people essentially at the end of a renting period don't expect to own a house. So if they want to own a house, they need to buy it out. But you own, you own the negative equity. Uh, well, <laughs> anyone, anyone who... They, they, are, they only own the negative equity for the half that they've bought. Yeah. They don't own the negative equity Yeah, but for the, the banks recognise that. You know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but there are, some, there are some developments which will come out from the department in relation to shared ownership uh, shortly. Uh, in terms of the explain the, the hurdles that we offer. We, we've basically two stages in our approval. If you want to get into the group that can borrow from us, you need to pass the first hurdle. 25 have applied, 12 have been successful. We basically look at their past, their present and their future, their past financials, their present governance and their future plans. And quite frankly, 12 of them weren't good enough to be approved that would say to us, 
we have a good chance of getting paid back our money because it's a semi-state where we're supposed to safeguard the assets of, of the state and the agency. Um, some of them have gone through the process more than once and have come out successfully at the end of it, but we're satisfied the 12 that have, have been uh, approved are the ones that are best uh, lent to. Of those 12, seven have borrowed money from us and the others are in the course of developing projects which will allow them to do it. Um, of the 180 million we've approved this year, 60 has been drawn down, um, and 100% of people who've applied to us for loans have got loans, and the reason they've got loans is that we've already been satisfied with their, their setup. So it's not that we've given them a bad offer or failed to give them an offer. Everyone who applies to a loan from us will get an offer, um, because as uh, Ms. Carroll explained, the, the cash flow that remunerates those loans comes from a payment and availability agreement, so there's fairly predictable cash flows. So once you show us your ability to manage it, you have a very, very good chance of getting a loan. Um, we have plenty of funds available. We have more than 500 million available for lending. It's a question of people coming to us and drawing them down. Um, the nature of what they're doing this year as opposed to last year, and we've seen a, a fourfold increase uh, to get to 180 million this year, there's a fourfold increase in our activity, and there's a noticeable amount of AHB activity this year compared to last year. And it just simply takes time now for, particularly the uh, building and development parts of the projects they're doing, to progress to the point where drawdown is necessary. So they're drawing down money in stages as, as a project uh, develops. Um, and there's plenty of money available. If, even if we got rid tomorrow of the 500 million, we could get more money from the EIB. They've made it quite clear they would give us more money. I think money. that's a statement that, uh, you know, I would hang on to. There's plenty of money available. But have we the wherewithal with it's the it's housing it's agencies? It's, it's, it's come back in well, plenty of money available to, you know, to draw down. That's yeah. what I want to hear. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. We have we have plenty of money, and it's cheap money. Uh, in relation to the, the items mentioned by Deputy Cowan, uh, I don't really want to get involved in the in the tenant purchase debate at all. Our function, we're a small specialist agency. Sean raises the money cheaply, we lend it cheaply. What we do is we basically fund um, schemes that the department are brought in. So the development of anything that's going on in, in tenant purchase is probably safest left alone for the moment. Uh, I think the department's focus primarily is on, on supplying houses to people. If they go into AHB houses and they're housed, worrying possibly about buying those houses later on is, is another issue, but I'll leave it at that. In terms of the HFA and what we might be able to do in relation to adaptation of homes, uh, quite frankly, I think there is actually probably a role here for the HFA in the sense that um, lending to local authorities is particularly cheap at the moment. We could lend fixed rate money. The EIB would give us fixed rate money for 25 years, probably around 1.5%. So we could lend that to the local authorities. We don't look for big margins because we don't need big margins. We could give that to the local authorities. So a billion, uh, sorry, a million pounds would cost very little to service on a day-to-day -day basis. So if the local authorities have the clearance from government to borrow money, there's a, there's a cheap way of delivering that. And there's certainly some cost benefit involved in, in adapting uh, homes and leaving people in homes rather than and the alternatives, which, as you say, are quite, quite expensive. Um, EIB money is available for retrofitting houses, so you know it's a, it's a reasonably good fit. Um, there is the overall restriction that all local authorities are suffering from at the moment, that the government's borrowing uh, restrictions prevents them from borrowing uh, a lot of money to increase the the government deficit. But that's that's another issue. I mean, I think if you balance up the benefit of that short that borrowing at cheaper rates to serve and being serviced uh, on a cheap rate versus the, the other costs that flow, somebody could draw the right conclusion, I think, but certainly we would be happy to play a role. There's easily money available there to, to lend. Thank you, Mr. Ailey. Next question, Deputy Boy Barrett. Yeah. Just following directly on from that point, uh, the, the, the local authorities are restricted from borrowing that money because of basically the fiscal, uh, the fiscal compact and the fiscal rules, the debt and deficit yeah. targets, isn't that right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, so hence the focus, given that the local authorities are prohibited from borrowing money, hence uh, we're trying to get the 
AHBs, the voluntary sector, to pick up the slack. That's the, the thinking. Um, so can I, uh, and hence the need to regulate and so on, I mean, can I ask, first of all, in uh, 2000, up until 2011, uh, all the money, am I correct in saying, that went to the AHBs was cap direct exchequer funding. So it's only after 2011, when this government comes into office, that uh, the funding drops significantly and uh, we start to move to uh, this focus on trying to get money elsewhere other than from the state. Is that correct? And the scheme changes then. Am I right? In, so, is it, yeah, in 2009, the leasing scheme was first introduced. Yeah. Uh, I think it was in 2011 that then that then extended to be able to open up AHBs to being able to borrow um, on specifically the on the private markets. But 2009 was when the change was to move towards a revenue-based funding okay. stream. But just so yeah. we're clear on the yeah. facts, from, uh, the direct state funding to the AHBs dropped from a high in 2008 of I think 1.7 billion to a current situation of, what is it, 400? Less than 400? The, the current level. I have a, a graph here, it's in the document we got from the Laroctus Library Service, and it just has uh, housing expenditure uh, capital 2007 to 2014, and it shows in 2008 there was 1.7 billion state funding available and in 2014 it has a, a fig. I'm just trying to clarify, is, is that money all going to the, uh, to, to the AHBs? Is that what this, do you, do you know, does that, do those figures make sense to you? Yeah, I, I don't have those figures before. I, I suspect that they might be the overall social housing provision figures. Um, Could you just yeah. if the information isn't yeah. at hand, Deputy, we might but I'm happy, to, I'm, I'm happy to try and come back uh, and I can provide the deputy okay. with information yeah. afterwards. What I'd yeah. like to see, if possible, yeah. is uh, the figures for the funding to the AHB sector from yeah. 2011 up to now, and if possible, the projected figures up to the end of 20, the 2020, the housing 2020 strategy. Yeah. It would be also useful then if we could compare that with the output from the sector for each yeah. of those years. Uh, and, but can you give me an indication? I mean, is the, uh, is the output from the sector, has it increased this year? How does it compare to last year? And what do we expect next year and the year after? So from our side of us, Deputy, um, there's been a fourfold in increase in the number of, uh, the physical number of applications that have come through, and the value of them is up by how much? Three, three times, is it? Yeah. The, the value of uh, loan approvals has increased fivefold, so it's up. The total number of approvals is 180 million, right? This year we've had approvals of around 125, 126 million, and last year that number was around 25 million. So there's been a very significant increase, increase in, in the approvals in 2015 from 2014. And do you know how that translates into units, like in comparison? Well, the, the, the units, it's, it's roughly, I think, about a three and a half fold increase in units because the unit price is obviously. You don't have a rough figure of, say, what 213 uh, was and what I, I, 214. I, um, I, I, think, I think it's in around uh, 800 uh, units in 2015 versus, I think, around 250 or so. 250. Yeah. That's, off, that's, that's off the top of my head. Do, do you so. know off the top of your head or close, you know, roughly, but of the 35,000 units that are identified between now and the end of 2020, how many of those are due to be delivered by the AHB sector? My understanding is that the departments haven't yet c confirmed that. But if you go back to the social housing strategy, they have given indications how much of that would be revenue based. And so obviously a lot of the output that's revenue based would have to come from either the leasing scheme or from AHBs using loan finance to fund acquisitions or constructions of property. So over time, in, in terms of the social housing strategy, you will see more and more reliance on the revenue funding, and that's with, that information is, is within the social housing strategy document. Um, but the specifics of how the revenue funding is split up hasn't been defined 
Um, so we, I, do, we don't know at the moment? We don't know. What I can say to you is we do an annual regulatory meeting with each of the Tier 3 bodies, and we've been looking um, and asking them to submit business plans to us and talk to us about their business plans over the next five years. So I can't give you individual years, but what I can say to you is nearly all of the Tier 3 bodies that we're looking at are looking at over that five-year period at, at a minimum of nearly doubling their stock size. Doubling the stock size yeah. uh, over the next three years, okay. Um, on the availability of private finance, so it's basically like sort of matching funding, is that you, there's a certain amount coming from, from you guys, which is, uh, do, do you guys get your money based on approval from the government, do you? Like, no. No, we just raise the money. You just raise the money. Yeah. So if we get money from the EIB and we get 150 million of a, a facility with them at the beginning of this year, EIB will only facilitate 50% of a, of a scheme. So there's a scheme for 10 million, they'll cough up five, and we'll put in the other five, or we'll get five from another source. Um, once the EIB offered the money for 150, another bank in Europe called the Council of Europe Development Bank offered a, another 150 facility, so they'll do the 50. So between our resources and the two sets of 150, there's more than 500 available at the moment. Um, and given what, what people are looking for, is that's more than enough to cover us for the next two or three years. But do, sorry, do the, do, the, do, do the approved housing bodies then go to private commercial banks in addition to getting money, borrowing money from you? Yes. They, they can also do that, but truthfully, most of the loans that are done in the market at the moment are done with us because our rates are so low that going to a bank doesn't make any commercial sense. So they'll come to us and they'll get the entire element of their funding requirement, which is usually around about 80% of the total purchase price of the, the scheme. They'll get it all from us. It's just that we'll have packaged it up in the background. To, just so there's to, not that much reliance on private commercial banks, in other words? No. Uh, you know, there's not a, a huge amount. Some um, bodies are deliberately a accessing them and some who do not have HFA-approved status will go to the private banks and access that funding. So it depends on both. And just maybe to go back in terms of the, the overall funding stream, there okay. is the money coming from the private lender or the HFA, then you have a capital advance coming from government, potentially from the Department of Environment via the local authority, and then you have a revenue payment coming in behind that, which goes over 20 to 30 year cash flow. So they're the three elements that make up the funding. Okay. Um, one thing that I'd be concerned about, uh, and I've, I've heard some criticism in England where this sector is much bigger, that profit, start, profit motives can potentially start to creep in. It, 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 is this, it, I haven't read through the heads of the bill yet, uh, is, is, is profit seeking excluded in this sector, in the legislation? No, the answer to that is no, it, 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 it isn't. Um, within the English environment, you might have a commercial element to some of what's being done, but the overall business, if it's meant to be a not-for-profit business, has to, the dominant factor has to be the not-for-profit housing provision, even within the, the, the UK element. Some of the provisions that are in this bill is a consent on disposals. So if somebody went, uh, an AHB went to go and sell a property or to give away the security of a property, um, then they would have to come to the regulator for consent on that. That would give the regulator the power to oversee how much that they weren't unnecessarily giving away security to fund commercial activities just on a whim. So that's maybe some one of the uh, difficulties that um, was experienced within the English market um, would have been a case whereby uh, the, a particularly large body went off and they secured assets, um, social housing assets, to do a risky commercial event, venture without seeking the consent of the regulator. And the regulator had to step in at that point, and they did so, and then they transferred the assets. Risky? What kind of risky? They did a lease project that they hadn't thought through properly. They didn't understand the project that they had done, so they went off doing a, a lease deal for student accommodation, um, which had nothing to do with the social housing provision. The idea was that that would raise some money to help social housing provision, but in doing so, they uh, inadvertently started using the social housing assets to secure that deal. And when the deal went wrong, it put the assets at risk. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that that doesn't happen. So while we won't be preventing profits 
seeking, so to speak, we would be guarding against safeguarding the asset. Okay, but pro so but profit seeking, in other words, these approved house bodies could set up on the basis of making money for shareholders or uh, gi yeah, giving dividends to shareholders and so on. Or oh, not to shareholders. Sorry, no, they still have to be not for profit. They what have to be not for profit. They have to be not for profit, but they could do activities that raise finance, but that, that they could put, put back into the not for profit business. Okay. Um, yeah, that's more or less it. I mean, just on the, the I mean, one of the things that uh, even the AHBs have said themselves in the, the shift to, I suppose, uh, source more social housing from that sector than has traditionally been the case, that they are just not resourced to uh, manage the problems that can come with a much bigger social housing stock in terms of dealing with tenants, concerns, maintenance issues, anti-social issues, you know, complaints, all the sort of stuff that uh, local authorities would be better resourced to do. Um, you know, can regulation deal with that problem when it's, you know, to some extent it is a resourcing and staffing problem? One of the things that regulation that we would require under the financial standard, which I talked about earlier, is that each large AHP is required to give us a, a, a business plan. Yeah. And that business plan has to show that if they're going to develop over the next five years yeah. thousands of units, how are they going to be able to manage that? And they have to show that on a cash flow over 30 years so that they think it all the way through of that loan finance. And so what regulation should be doing, if it's good regulation, is actually ensuring that the capacity of the sector is coming up to rise to the challenge of the risk that they're going to take on. And so we are looking for those things to be earmarked within the standards that we would be introducing. So as I said, we would be looking for strategic plans, business plans, annual returns, all to monitor that those things that you're talking about are being thought about in advance and then being done as per the business plan that they have sought to do. Oh, sorry, just one last, very last question. Yeah. There's, there's a close connection between, obviously, uh, very close connection at the moment, between the housing list that local authorities have and, you know, people being housed from that list into the uh, AHBs and a, a, a rent scheme that's uh, similar. Is that going to sort of be fully maintained? that relationship? Yeah, it, it, it's not proposed in any way to change the relationship of the local authority at the moment in terms of nomination rights to properties um, and they would still be responsible for um, agreeing the local rents with the AHB at a local level, but those things would stay local with the local authority. Okay, this that concludes our consideration of the topic for this part of the meeting. I want to thank our witnesses and the very frank and detailed exchange they have with members. We're going to suspend for two minutes and come back in private correspondence. For two minutes. We're going to suspend. So we're suspended. Thanks for to leave. Thank you very much indeed. Will you stay for two minutes for the private stuff?